You're listening to The Whole Church Podcast. Our efforts to educate and unite the church are made possible thanks to our sponsors on Patreon. Please consider joining them for $3 a month, where you'll get discounts on our upcoming events, as well as our merchandise, and you even get some free giveaways every three months. Romans 8, verses 18-25 through 25 in the New American Standard Bible reads, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the eagerly awaiting creation waits for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pain of childbirth together until now. And not only that, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, through perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. (laughs) Here, St. Paul is writing to the church at Rome, and he is explaining the consequences of salvation. He's like, because we're saved, this is what's happening. This is like the process of salvation causes these things. Um, I like to use the word process. Uh, After discussing the struggle between the flesh, the spirit, all this kind of stuff, he gets to this and he makes this comparison of the future glory awaiting us. And he makes past statements of like birthing pains for creation. And then he makes kind of a reference to us doing similar groans, but then calls us sons and daughters. And it's kind of like, hmm, that's a little awkward. (laughs) Um, Jennifer, what do you believe this analogy of birthing pains can reveal to us about our own nature and our relationship to one another, creation, God, all of it? Yeah, so this image is uh, so rich uh, and so multi-layered. First of all, when you think about it, this personification of all creation as a woman in labor Mm -hmm. gives honor and importance to the childbearing work of women, right? That's sort of like in in the background there. Um, Paul is, you know, recognizing the suffering that women go through in childbirth. You know, and Paul uses a lot of feminine images actually in his writings, and we tend to not like focus on them um, as yeah. much. But here, you know, he's focusing in on the, the vital work that women do as mothers. But there's a lot more going on in the imagery, right? Um, when you think about mothers do going through the work of labor, uh, this is true. But then in the ancient Mediterranean world, they would not have been alone in their labor. Oh. Like a community of women, women gather around a birthing mom. Uh, there would be midwives and like other people hmm. who are helping. You know, we have this very individualistic idea of how um, birth takes place because we go to a hospital and it's usually just a doctor or a nurse and yeah. our spouse, <laughs> right? But that's not how it was in the ancient world. So when you think about this communal image, Paul, I think, is probably drawing on that part, that circumstance of communal support in the midst of suffering when he is talking about creation, like all of it suffering together. Um, And I think we miss that sometimes, Um, but here we are suffering together and also we are suffering with Christ because the verse like right before this passage talks about that, that we also suffer with Christ. Um, But I think the most surprising part about this childbirth metaphor, um, at least surprising for like contemporary American Christians, Um, is that, like you said, he's talking about a process of salvation, right? Mm -hmm. Not a moment. He's talking about the redemption of all creation. So like labor, which is a long process, so is this renewal of earth and of humanity. Um, We like to make salvation this individual endeavor, right? Um, Yeah. the, The praying of the prayer and accepting Jesus and I get to go to heaven and all of that. But that's just not the biblical picture of salvation, you know? Yeah, I I find it really telling every time it talks about salvation, it's almost always communal, it seems like. I I don't want to say for sure, because I'm not that much of a Bible expert that I could say that. But I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, all of the times, even the times like where people put out, like, work out your own salvation. He's talking to a group of people when he says that, you know? Yeah, yeah, so it's fascinating. I, um, 
this the one downside to podcast is I can't highlight because all of the things you just said, I'm like, I just want to go over that with a highlighter. I'm like, I could sit in that that historical part that you added of like the communal. I yeah. I never knew that. And now I need to find a commentary that says that so that I can highlight. It. Yeah, you can also <laughs> um, look at it in paintings. So if you're in a more collectivist society, not individualist society, they'll they'll paint um, the nativity scene and there will be a lot of people there. You know, it's not just Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. <laughs> Man, yeah, that's wild. Yeah. I'm, this is probably the longest prelude we've ever had, but I'm just so <laughs> fascinated by your answer. You also mentioned other imagery that Paul uses about um, the church and women and how we don't typically focus on the feminine ones. Could you give a couple examples real quick? Right, well, no, so he talks about, sometimes he talks about himself, actually, and his um, missionary uh, people as, as like, sort of midwives, as mothers, as, you know, he uses that imagery to talk about himself, not just talk about God, right? So um, he does that quite a bit. There's a great book, and I want to say, like, maybe Beverly Gaventa, she's a a New Testament scholar, she wrote it, and she talks about sort of all the maternal images in Paul. So that would be something worth looking I'm gonna find at. It's, that. it's yeah. pretty fun. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, I think when it comes to the salvation idea um, that he's getting at, like the main idea is that it is, it is communal. We are all working towards the salvation of, of creation, you know, and it's not just us. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful image. Oh yeah. And it's not prosperity gospel. It's <laughs> suffering together. So <laughs> there we yeah, go. <laughs> that's exactly yeah. it. We're in this together. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hey everybody, welcome to the Whole Church Podcast, possibly your favorite church unity podcast. You're probably already tired of hearing my voice because it was a long verse. I usually make TJ do those because I'm so bad at reading and he was late. So without further ado, um, the the one, I don't know if you guys know this, but adjectives exist, even bad ones, unfortunately, as a response to people not having a way to properly articulate the wonder that is the one, the only, the greatest co-host of all time, Tiberius one, Blackwell, TJ, how's it going? Uh, it's, it's going great, thanks. Yeah. Did you know that you were the cause of all adjectives? Uh, I had a feeling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we are also brought by everyone's favorite appetizer, uh, David Pizza Roll. Welcome back. He's uh, going to be a guest host with us today. And we are interviewing the one and only, um, I think I think one of my favorite people I've ever heard do a live panel ever, actually. Might just hands down be my favorite. <laughs> The Reverend Doctor Jennifer Basha, or just Jennifer. How's it going? Pretty good. Awesome, awesome. I am so excited. These are like four awesome or three awesome people, and I get to be here to talk to you guys. And we're gonna be talking a lot about Jennifer's background as well as gender and God and what does all of this mean? How can we have feminism and Christianity? We got some deep stuff we're gonna get into, so I'm gonna try not to go on any further. All right. Uh, make sure you check out our convention website in the description below. Use the code WHOLE, W-H-O-L-E, for 40% off at checkout. If you join the Patreon, it'll be 60% off. Just a little tip. Get your ticket. It's going to be a great time. We're going to have food trucks and all kinds of awesome activities to do. Uh, if you join our Patreon, you can also get access to our Q&A Discord channel, one of the bonus segments we do. Uh, yeah. 10% off merch. There's a lot of stuff there. Go check it out. Yeah. Free just stuff. to be honest, if you ask us questions, it's probably just going to lead to us asking other people those questions. Yeah. But that's fine. <laughs> well, guys, you know, I have a favorite form of unity. I, I don't know if Jennifer is aware of this, but um, it's actually impossible to be in division when you are being as goofy as I am about to be in my favorite, our silly question segment. Uh, we just ask a silly question. We'll all answer it first, let you have as much time to think about it as possible. Um, I don't remember what today's is, so I'm excited to figure out with you all. If you could throw a party with any one kind of sea creature, wow, which sea creature would you choose? Uh, TJ, this one is so up your alley, you have to answer first. It's mm-hmm. a necessity. Killer whales. <laughs> Why? You have any idea how smart killer whales are? Yeah, they're they know terrifying. How <laughs> they know I mean, how to party. Yeah, they're also terrifying yeah i'm not even gonna have to plan anything i'm just gonna show up and we're gonna have a good time (laughs) i mean fair enough 
So Much Meat just wants to say sea turtles because they're my favorite, but I don't imagine them having a great party, honestly. I'm... What's funny is I remember if I, when I wrote this, I had to have had a better answer than this. But my answer is going to be I'm pulling full SpongeBob, bumping up the music in a pineapple under the sea with some jellyfish. Yeah. Yeah. You think... All right. Uh, yeah, it's going to work exactly be, the same. <laughs> uh, I'd probably go with seahorses. Mm -hmm. uh, because if the party is underwater... I'd imagine they know how to throw down. And if not, I mean, it'd end up being like some therapy session uh, <laughs> for a bunch of pregnant dudes. And if, mm -hmm, sure. and if it's like on dry land, if the party's on dry land, then I mean, seahorses are tiny and it'd be easy to clean up all their little dead seahorse bodies. Sadly. I, that's depressing, but yeah. <laughs> I, I think your therapy session might also be able to get some more about the pains of childbirth and creation and salvation in there. <laughs> Add to our conversation. <laughs> uh, Jennifer. Okay, so which, can which they the, be yeah. fictional sea creatures? Is that okay? DJ? Sure. Yes. I'm good. <laughs> then, the mer, then mer people, for sure. Ooh. Like, yeah. I was a huge Little Mermaid fan when I came out. I must have been in middle school or something, and I memorized, like, the whole thing and the whole singing, the girl, the sisters, we are the daughters of Triton and all of that. Okay, yeah. Yeah, good times. Yeah. It's a good too. movie. <laughs> are Are you excited for the for the remake coming up? I am. No, absolutely. Very oh. excited. Yeah, yeah. Man, I, I'm so torn just because of other Disney live actions where I'm like, hmm, I didn't love the remake of Li Lion King. But I also, I do love these things staying relevant, so... Right. I'll take what I can get, I guess. Aladdin was pretty good, I think. That's true. I loved, I loved, other than there's like one scene that I was like, that's a little weird. But mm -hmm. I did love Aladdin and the Beauty and the Beast remakes. They mm -hmm. did great. Yeah. Yeah. True. Beauty and the Beast is good. So, one thing we found that really helps with Christian unity is to hear one another's story. Now, would you mind sharing your story of how you came to the faith with us? Yes. Um, so, I grew up. Uh, in the church, in the Southern Baptist Church, actually. Um, so I remember very clearly when I had sort of a, a, an initial encounter with Jesus, if you want to call it that. Um, it was when I was in kindergarten and my Sunday school teacher had like talked about Jesus. And that night I just felt this conviction that comes often from sort of a more evangelical way of, of presenting the gospel, right? And when I was <laughs> crying and I just, I kind of count that as like the, the initial encounter I had um, with God. And then after that, like God became very important in my life as a, you know, sense of um, nurturing and comfort. You know, I loved going to church and I loved reading the Bible and all that. So um, I lived with that growing up. But the problem came when I got older and got a sort of felt a call to ministry and I was probably in high school by then, and I was in the Southern Baptist Church, so they did not support women in in all aspects of ministry, right? Only in particular ones, um, and so that was really that was really difficult trying to figure out my call in a place where they mm -hmm. um, they limited it to children's working with children or being a missionary, right? And so I. Um, ended up going to Baylor and like did all sorts of things, leading Bible studies and things like that. But I still, um, you know, was in that environment where it was like, well, you can't really be a pastor. Um, mm -hmm. I did end up going to seminary cause I, I still wanted to follow that calling in some way. Um, and then I worked in churches and things like that. But, um, because the reality of Southern Baptist life in Texas, where mm -hmm. I grew up was that I wasn't probably going to be a pastor of a church. I ended up uh, taking a more academic route, uh, but that actually helped me um, in my calling and fulfilling a calling. So now I kind of feel like I have a pastoral and a teaching calling. So now I teach um, the Bible, nice. which, I which I love to do. And uh -huh. I, I love Fun. to do things with the church as well. So Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, what's what's weird is the three of us probably have a really strange perspective. We well, actually, I don't know if David grew up in this church, but all of us were part of a, um, a Pentecostal denomination at one point mm -hmm. that was extremely conservative. It was a holiness Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. TJ's still a part of it. David's like half part of it. I'm just like Lutheran hybrid now. But <laughs> they, even though they're extremely conservative, still have women pastors, which is always really weird to me when like now that I've seen more of like broader theology out in the world, I'm like, 
that's like a mark of like liberal theology. And it's just really weird that that's just a part of this denomination. I mean, cool, but weird. Yeah. Yeah, it's a whole, it's a Holy Spirit thing. I mean, the denominations that tend to emphasize the Holy Spirit are are more open to the Spirit speaking through anybody, yeah. all different kinds of people. And so, I think from <laughs> the beginning, women had um, a bigger part, you know, in Pentecostal movements because of the emphasis on the Holy Spirit. So it's good. It's a good thing. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. So you've already touched on a lot of this, uh, but what are some more details that you can share about your story? And going from like a conservative Baptist background to where you are in your faith now, and you've touched on some of the uh, the restrictiveness of being in a Southern Baptist convention, but uh, where are you now and what are some details about how you got there? Yeah. Yeah. So I think this is a good question for this time um, that we find ourselves in. Like so many people are if you want to call it deconstructing or trying to like look at their faith tradition and figure out um, how do we move forward with it? But what's interesting, I think about me is that my deconstruction, if you want to call it that, um, was a really long journey. Um, so much so that it didn't, it wasn't traumatic. It wasn't like one big thing happened necessarily. Um, and you know, I questioned everything. No, because I started reading scripture really early and I'm a person who um, likes literature. You know, I've always read scripture as literature. And so it helped me, um, you know, as I started coming up against things in the world that didn't seem to match with the Bible, I'm like, well, maybe there's some um, literary stuff going on here. And so it was a, it was a slow, long, slow process. Um, and the, I would say there are a lot of people that have negative ideas about deconstruction, but I would say <laughs> like my deconstruction was actually prompted by scripture like by mm-hmm. my own reading of scripture, it wasn't that I was rebelling against it somehow. Um, I just was focusing on the Jesus story a lot. And that helped me, you know, look at scripture in a different way, but it also felt very spirit led. It felt very love focused. It wasn't me, you know, being angry mm-hmm. about anything. It was something that I did as I grew closer to God and understanding the character of God. Um, I started deconstructing or if you want to call it some people are going to call it like became more progressive or whatever. um but yeah. it was yeah it wasn't like a rebellion or anything like that which i think some people look at it that way um it was a very um slow but sort of um helpful constructive process you know yeah. not not necessarily deconstructive <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean some people might today would have called what martin luther did deconstruction but. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe yeah. the, the next Protestant Reformation will just be called the Great Deconstruction. We'll see. Right. And his was, you know, um, motivated by scripture, too, his reading of scripture. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Makes- yeah. And uh, they probably thought he got a lot more liberal. <laughs> they probably I mean, did. From that, from their perspective. <laughs> yeah, they probably did. But, yeah. <laughs> Man. So, speaking of a little bit more progressive theology, we've actually met at Trip Fuller's uh, Theology Beer Camp. He's been on the show just a couple of weeks ago. Awesome guy. Love him. Yeah. Love everyone I met there. It's a great group of people. Um, you made a suggestion during one of the panels. I mentioned earlier, my favorite panel ever, probably, <laughs> that you you said maybe we should practice using more feminine pronouns for God in our prayers. You Could you unpack that a little bit? Like, what were you talking about? Why do you think that's an important practice? And um, how do you think it could be useful? Yeah. So I'll give you a little bit of background um, or I guess your listeners because they weren't at the talk. But in my (laughs) talk, I expressed how I have uh, experienced God as a feminine presence in my life throughout my whole life. So the Mm -hmm. people who showed Jesus love to me in the church um, and in the world were mostly women. Uh, And I've also experienced the Holy Spirit in ways that would be maybe associated with the more typically feminine characteristics like nurturing, um, empowering, like I guess it would be nurturing like a mother, empowering like a sister, comforting like an affectionate friend, right? But the fact is we do not encourage that kind of language for God in the church, probably because our history has been dominated by masculine and only masculine language for God. Um, and so I was talking about how if we actually begin to lo- to use more inclusive language for God, um, mm-hmm. then at, it expands our understanding of God. Uh, it deepens our experience of God, right? It can draw us into um, a better relationship with the divine because we're getting a bigger, a bigger picture of, of who God is. So yeah, that's the reason why I think it's good to use <laughs> feminine pronouns and feminine language for God. Yeah. 
So follow up question. I'm going a little bit off script. I'm uh, I'm genuinely <laughs> curious. Yeah. Uh, do you think that a lot of that is historically uh, because of the gender roles that we assign to some of these qualities where like, I mean, growing up in my household, my mom was generally the breadwinner and uh, my dad was in charge of raising us. And so a lot of these qualities where it would be considered, where these would be considered like feminine qualities, I actually got from my dad. He was very nurturing. He was very kind and uh, very uh affectionate towards my brothers and I and we're in an all boy household I don't have any sisters but I have four brothers wow you know and so uh (laughs) so my question is are are those feminine attributes or are they just uh healthy attributes that historically because we've assigned them to females Mm -hmm. historically uh people have seen them as less important because of the way that you know hmm. history has been written or played yeah. out yeah yeah i think the second is true i think th- that we have assigned them to be more feminine or female characteristics right but they are just like you said good healthy characteristics um but because we have such a long history of doing that right we have um stopped referring to god and sometimes jesus too um with those very healthy important characteristics and it has to do with the fact that we that that we hmm. shy away from the more feminine images because of the way society treats mm-hmm. women and in the church too. Right. So, yeah. yeah, no, I think, I think you're right. It's, I wish we didn't have to say that these were feminine characteristics, but they have been assigned yeah. that way. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, much less serious question. Uh, so with your Southern Baptist uh, convention background, uh, do you think they'd be more mad at the suggestion to refer to God with uh, she, her pronouns or they, them, since, you know, the Bible says we, I mean, <laughs> That is so interesting. <laughs> yeah, because right now, like who, like this, some of the Raptors Convention, who do they hate more? Women <laughs> who are trying to be leaders or the LGBT community? Like, I don't know. I feel like <laughs> toss I up. feel like it's a toss up. Like they would be angry no matter what. Whatever. Flip a coin. We'll see. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> so, what stories or passages in the Bible do you feel most uplift these feminine? Uh, qualities or attributes either yeah, in god's so attributes or otherwise yeah yeah there, so there are two ways to look at this um, um one would be uh, ways that god is portrayed so this is something that people don't talk about in church that much um but there is a character uh in the old testament and then some other second temple literature uh called lady wisdom uh, some people call her woman wisdom right and so that is actually the personification of god's teaching and of god's character and God's wisdom, right? Um, so Lady Wisdom comes up in Proverbs and other places. Um, so that's one way there's a, that's very feminine image, um, for God. And then you, oh gosh, you hear, you see God described as a mother hen, as a mama bear, as a birthing mother, as a nursing mother. There's like so many different images. Um, a lot of them are in prophetic literature, actually, um, where you see all of these images. Um, so I think that's there, but I think we also need to talk about how God's presence is mediated through women um, in the Gospels. So this is this is not necessarily like using um, traits or characteristics or whatever feminine characteristics to describe God, but this is actually asking the question: Where does God show up in Jesus's story? Um, and so when you read through the Gospels, you see that women are very much the presence of God for Jesus in his key moments. Um, we don't like to think about Jesus like we don't like to think about the human Jesus needing sort of someone else to mediate God to him. But, you know, if he was truly human, then he also needed to feel the supporting presence of God through the people that are around him. Right. So when you Mm -hmm. think about it, you have Mary, his mother was, um, was the presence of God to him when she births him and feeds him and nurtures him. Right. And then when you get to Luke, there's um, these women who support Jesus's ministry financially, Right. And probably other ways, too. And so you kind of see mm-hmm. God um, providing for Jesus through these women. Right. And then when you get to the cross, women are the only people who are there at the cross um, of his disciples. And so you imagine that that um, they became the presence of God for Jesus in his hour of need right there. Mm-hmm. So like 
really, there's so much scripture that shows us um, what we might call the divine feminine, but, but we haven't been trained to look at it in that way, whether mm-hmm. it's descriptions or whether it's stories and the way women show up in stories, like we just do, we overlook it really easily because of the way, you know, we're taught to read scripture, I guess. Yeah. I um, <laughs> think Dave and I are about to get on TJ's nerves. We both have back, uh, follow-up questions, <laughs> but <laughs> I, um, I'm, I'm going to ask something that's borderline heretical really quickly. Okay. <laughs> Shocking. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, I, I heard on a recent podcast when we're talking about things in the Bible that uplift the feminine, one one woman I heard, I wish I could remember who it was. Um, it was one of the interviews the Holy Post did, but she brought up the the fact that God is referred to as father even uplifts the feminine because it implies mother. The heretical part of that question is, who is the mother, right? I, I know that um, some whenever the Jewish people had more of a, you know, whatever thing, they, they would refer to Asherah as God's wife, which right. obviously we don't believe. That's kind of, you know, not the Bible. You mentioned wisdom. Um, people talk about Mother Earth. Is is there a mother if the God is the Father? <laughs> right. No. No. I think you're onto something there um, because God enc- encapsulates all of that. When when you're talking about a monotheistic religion like yeah. like Judaism, like God uh, encompasses all of those characteristics. So yeah. So when if Jesus is saying, you know our father who art in heaven, right? There may be a a sort of bigger sense of parent, right? Even though the word parent isn't used, probably not common for them to use the word parent in um, any of those ancient languages, Hebrew or Greek. But, um, but yeah, no, I like that idea that, that, that it's, (laughs) it's a more encompassing term, right? Some people might even say Jesus calls God father because he already has a mother, on earth, but probably Joseph is, has died early. So he doesn't have a father. And so that's the way he relates to God. I don't know. We don't, we oh, don't know. Exactly. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. We don't know exactly. Why, but okay. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to get us all in trouble with that question real quick. Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm really glad you brought up lady wisdom. Uh, when I first got saved, when I was 14, I read the book of uh, Proverbs over yeah. and over. Cause it was just the only book that didn't bore me when I first got saved. <laughs> and, uh, but, Man, uh, I wrestled with that for a long time because I was like, okay, hold on. I read in 1 Corinthians that Paul calls Jesus the wisdom of God incarnate. Uh And so I started thinking like, okay, so, but Jesus is a man, but it's referred to the wisdom of God earlier than that as a female, right? Right. And hold on, let me think of how to ask this follow-up question. (laughs) (laughs) Uh. Okay, yeah. So going into that First Corinthians thing, uh, this goes back to what we touched on earlier about the the traditional view of masculine and feminine uh, attributes and qualities, uh, and it goes in. It touches on how people thought Jesus was going to come. Right. And they thought that he would be a conquering king right. with riding in on like a stallion with full armor and having an army behind him. <laughs> but Jesus showed up with, with, you know, this caring and meek persona mm-hmm. that was more attributed to the, to the meek and weak and the, the poor and powerless people. Right. And so when calling Jesus the wisdom of God incarnate, uh, Paul paints this picture of God using the opposite of what we expected to bring us closer to him or using the foolishness of God to confound the wise. Right. And so I think that that seeing all these qualities of God as the more feminine qualities like like you're talking about is is so essential to our faith because – it's kind of like, okay, well, how the heck is God going to conquer the world by being this meek and mild uh, person, you know, or calling us to turn the other cheek when we're insulted or whatever? Right. So my question to you is, uh, do you think that that there's a reason that in Proverbs, wisdom is referred to as a lady, but then in, New, in the New Testament, Jesus is referred to as God's wisdom incarnate? Yeah, yeah, I do. I think um, though this would have happened, uh, Paul would have been writing before John. Um, but when John writes the prologue of the Gospel of John, um, 
he uses the word, you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. So that term, the logos has a whole bunch of things wrapped up in it. And one of the mm-hmm. things is lady wisdom. Mm-hmm. And that it, wisdom is, is involved there. So yeah. So he uses that terminology to refer to Jesus. And I think that that's putting together the, the characteristics of lady wisdom with other characteristics of Jesus. Um, so I think it must have been in the way that they were speaking in the early church because it shows up in, in Paul and it shows up in John as well. Um, so I think, oh. yeah, I think, I think Jesus is um, the way that they want to portray Jesus is to say, Hey, no, remember when we had this lady wisdom and that was one way that God showed up to us. Okay. So here's Jesus showing up to us um, as God as well. And it's going to, encapsulate that lady wisdom image as well so yeah fascinating yeah so good stuff are are there any passages of scripture you feel like are extremely problematic for a a feminist affirming mindset well i mean if if you think about it really the whole the whole context that within which the bible was written is sort of problematic (laughs) for (laughs) feminism you know what i'm saying like when when the whole all the people who were writing um the bible were in a patriarchal society and they had particular ideas um about Mm -hmm. men and women and the structure of society and things like that um so that's going to come out in their writing for sure and if we affirm that scripture is both divine and human the human part of it's going to come out from their like their context so yeah i mean it's going to it's going to rise up in lots of different places i mean the places that people tend to go to to use against women um against women in ministry are going to be some of the passages in paul where he's talking to very specific churches about problems that they're having. Um, and he starts talking about what women can and can't do. Right. Um, when he does a household codes, which are very much based on the household codes of the Greco Roman world, which are Mm -hmm. of course, very patriarchal, that's going to come out there as well. So there's a lot of problematic passages, but when we read it, um, understanding that context and we look for the places where, um, they're sort of, trajectories away from that away from patriarchy mm-hmm. patriarchy then i think that's where we, what we need to grab a hold of because that shows us sort of like really jesus's whole life was anti-patriarchal the way that he treated women um sort of brought them into the center of society in his in his ministry um that is one trajectory right the fact that paul does say that men and women should submit to one another um mm-hmm. In Ephesians five, that's the first thing he says. That's that's a trajectory that takes us away from that heavily patriarchal society. So yeah, there's a lot of problematic passages, but I think if we read it in its context, we'll see that it's pointing beyond that patriarchal society to the future. Like, what does new creation <laughs> look like? What does the kingdom look like? Um, equality, <laughs> right? That's yeah. that's what it looks like. And you know, people don't like the word feminist, but really, it is about equality. Yeah. It's not about exalting women over other people or anything like that. Yeah. One of the – if people want to see this, I, I think one of the best studies to do, if you go through uh, first thing Thessalonians and you look at Paul's writings, it very much – if you take yourself away from it, you know, try to be a third party just reading this book, it, it see, really feels like the author is – Kind of going back and forth between these ideas of, yes, everyone's equal now, but also we still need to have structure. And what does this look like? And he's wrestling, trying to figure it out. And it definitely feels like there's a trajectory. So if you read those books specifically, I think it kind of highlights what she's saying here. Whether you agree or not, I think that's a good place to see it if you want to kind of get a feel for what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So even though most preachers would say that God is without gender because God is spirit. Uh, a lot of preachers and speakers will will insist on using father or masculine language of scripture to make it and make it a huge deal mm-hmm. of Jesus as a male. Mm-hmm. How do you respond to those who treat the gender of God as a first tier issue, even though they claim that God doesn't have a gender? Oh yeah. So I think what's happening with people who like obsess about that about the gender of God, um, is because they really are obsessed with gender differences in society. Like the, many people um, from some more evangelical contexts, but definitely Southern Baptists where I come from, um, they are very invested in the idea that there are roles for men and there are roles for women, right? And that's sort of their, the the core of what they, they adhere to. <laughs> it, that, that's what they want to teach. That's what they how they want the church to, to look. And so then I think 
those people who care very much about that will care very much about talking about the gender of God, right? They will not like the idea of using um, feminine language for God. They, they will play up the masculinity of Jesus, however you want to say that, um, because they're actually more concerned with what's happening societally, right? And then they're mm-hmm. trying to project that onto God. And I think that's, that's really dangerous, right? Um, to start yeah. with what you want <laughs> for your church, what you want your church to, to act out and believe and not start with actually Jesus' life, Jesus' mm-hmm. life in scripture. Like that's a problem, right? Yeah. yeah. Some of those preachers uh, would call that eisegesis if you were doing it with any other topic. Yes. Oh, no, man. <laughs> no, that's exactly right. It is eisegesis. Yeah. Good call. <laughs> so, You have a book out now called Scapegoats, the Gospel Through the Eyes of Victims. Uh, What can you tell us about the background of this work and what inspired it? Mm. Well, I I mean, I did work on a name, a guy named um, Rene Girard during my dissertation. So um, I studied him and he's the guy who puts forth this idea about a scapegoat theory and Jesus a scapegoat. Um, and so, so I had that in the background, but the, the reason that I started writing the book was actually cause I, I was looking around, um, at Christians and of course I teach in a Christian university. So I have a lot of students that come out of Christian backgrounds and I was looking around at that and then about, you know, just social media and other places. And I saw that people were not, people who were claiming to be Christians were not showing up in the world like Mm -hmm. Jesus. They didn't look like Jesus. They didn't (laughs) act like Jesus. They didn't seem to even know what Jesus taught or what, you know, what his life was about. Yeah. So I thought, golly, this is a real problem. (laughs) So what, why, like, why is it that they don't know? And I think that we, um, I wanted to highlight things in, in the gospels, um, that people tend to overlook. Right. Yeah. So I wanted to write about the gospels and I thought that using Gerard's um, theory of the scapegoat would actually help, um, you know, provide this good framework for looking at the way that mm-hmm. Jesus interacted with people in his society, because he does end up um, interacting most of the time with the victims in his society, um, people who are scapegoats. And I can talk more about mm-hmm. scapegoats if you want me to. <laughs> I would love that. What is a scapegoat as you understand it? <laughs> okay. Okay. I realize as I'm going on, I'm like, oh no, maybe let's talk about what a scapegoat is. Um, so generally speaking, you know, um, scapegoats are people who are who um, society um, puts their their sin or puts blame on them, though they tend to be innocent um, of the sins that they're being accused of. Right. So going way back in history to ancient societies, um, they would literally sacrifice um, a person um, in order to. Um, achieve peace in their in their society. So Gerard says that um, we are mimetic creatures, which means we imitate one another and we want what one another has. And that causes conflict in society. And that conflict sort of grows until it, it becomes so big that there's just violence um, between the members of a society. And so he looks at different societies, um, civilizations and sees, okay, the mm-hmm. way that they deal with this is that they tend to take this violence that, um, focused uh, of all against all, I guess, and take it and focus it on one person. And Mm -hmm. when they focus that violence and that blame on one person, then they either exile that person or kill that person, sacrifice that person. And that then um, calms down the violence, um, the conflict in society for a little while. So of course, um, the the Israelites had this, they had a literal scapegoat. That's where we get the word from <laughs> the scapegoat. right? <laughs> yeah. um, and they put the, they symbolically um, placed the sins of the community on the scapegoat and then, you know, sent it out into the wilderness. Um, so they don't actually kill that goat. Um, but there are societies, early societies who ki- literally killed people um, for this. Um, and so, so mm-hmm. today we don't tend to sacrifice people, right? Literally. Not usually. Um, not usually. Um, but we, this mechanism he calls the scapegoat mechanism still operates in our society when, you know, things uh, get kind of tense when there are times mm-hmm. where people are losing um, their position and power. They tend to put blame onto um, other people so that they can keep their position, keep their power, um, keep their peace, really, um, if you want to look at it that way. But those scapegoats tend to be people who are um, 
on the margins of society, who are outsiders, people who um, don't have a lot of people standing up for them so that so that that whole putting the blame on them can actually work. Like no one's going to stand up for them and say, no, mm-hmm. they're innocent. Right. So these are the people who tend to be scapegoats. And these are the people that Jesus um, interacted with. These are the ones that he um, drew sort of into the center of society. Uh, he wanted their voices to be heard and and them to um, become important in his ministry. And then, of course, he ends up being a scapegoat, right? Mm -hmm. He, all of the sort of powers and uh, going on, the political powers and the religious powers um, there in Jerusalem sort of focus on Jesus. And then they they sacrifice him to uh, achieve a peace, like a temporary sort of peace. So Gerard Mm -hmm. says that because the gospel writers tell this story about the innocent Jesus, who we scapegoat, who we kill, um, then we should be able to be aware of when we're doing it now. Like he mm-hmm. should be the scapegoat to end all scapegoats. Um, and we Christians should know better. We should stop scapegoating because <laughs> we, we know yeah. the ultimate scapegoat, right? Um, that's not how it, it ends up working yeah. out in church history. And so that's what I did in my book. Like look, looked at Jesus' interactions with scapegoats, talked about how it is that we, the church, um, miss the point, and we continue mm. to scapegoat people in society today. So the yeah. ultimate scapegoat is not the Democrats. No. Man, <laughs> no. who knew? No. Did you guys, uh, did you guys see that tweet that said we should pin all the debt in the world on one guy, then kill him? Uh, I that's no. sure did not. Yeah. What? I'm not saying we should, but that's, that's a great example of a scapegoat. It's a great example. Yeah, that's yeah. uh that's something we shouldn't do. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. I uh. <laughs> Also, scapegoat and um, writing on the wall. Those are two like of those like catchphrases that's made it to pop culture zeitgeist that I love just to point out that actually came from the Bible, guys. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So where or how can we see or how can viewing the gospel through the eyes of victims kind of change our understanding of it? Um, Looking at it from the perspective of the scapegoat, how does that change the story of the gospel? Right. So one, what we talked about in the beginning here is that salvation is not this sort of individualistic thing. Like I got to I got to get myself to heaven. Um, And so that's why Jesus died. Right. It gives you a a bigger perspective on what's happening in the world um, that, no, Jesus didn't just come here to um, die and save you, you know, from your individual sins. There's like a societal thing going on here. Right. There are uh, we as humans um, tend to oppress marginalize and hurt the people um, who are powerless. And um, the gospel is that those powerless people are the center of the kingdom, right? All of the mm-hmm. teachings of Jesus we see in the Sermon on the Mount and, um, and in, in Luke and other places saying that there's an upside down kingdom. And so when we focus on the scapegoats or the victims in the story, then it makes that um, nature, that upside down nature of the kingdom um, become more clear, Right. And then we can say, oh, wait, it's not just it's not just oh liberals are, you know, talking about marginalized people or whatever. No, Jesus <laughs> talked about marginalized people um, and yeah. he wanted to he wanted to not just um, change their position, but change the whole society so that it's the meek and the humble, um, the poor. Those are the people who inherit the kingdom, you know, not the rich, the powerful, the religious. So when we look at it through the eyes of scapegoats, then we can kind of see um what the gospel writers were trying to communicate in their in their context right we tend not to look yeah. at it that way but gosp- the gospel writers were christians early christians who they themselves were scapegoats right in society yeah. and then they're telling the story of a scapegoat and then the main characters of the gospels are scapegoats so it really helps to look at it through that perspective yeah yeah it's um so much there that's so good i um it's very telling how many times pastors read for God so loved the world, he's in his only begotten son, so that all may be saved, and then go on a personal savior rant on how he died for you. And I was like, that's not what that verse says, actually. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. So we talked about what people were used as scapegoats back then, mm-hmm. but what groups in our own culture today would you say serve as scapegoats? Yeah, so – um I divide my book up into three different sections. And the first section is um, women as scapegoats. So because of the structures of our societies, um, women tend to um, have to carry the burden of a lot of things. They become um, sexual scapegoats, right? Um, If someone is um, 
accused of rape, they say, well, what was the woman wearing? You know, like put the blame on the woman. Um, but they're also social um, and mm-hmm. economic scapegoats. Like w- women p- have the heavy burden of um, the greed in our society, because when you think about single single mothers, like how much they suffer because of the way that our um, society is structured. So women, definitely, they're not just scapegoats in society, they're scapegoats in, in the church as well. But the second section is um, about... Um, the poor and the infirmed. So people who are, um, if you want to talk about people with illness or, or with disability, um, and then people who are mm-hmm. poor, the church throughout history has had a very um, um, strained relationship with those two. <laughs> they will yeah. tend to like want to help and do things, but then they also like will blame pe- poor people for being poor. You know, they'll take people with disabilities or illnesses and say, um, you're the way you are because you don't have enough faith. You know what I'm saying? Like we, yeah. we have treated them um, poorly throughout history. Um, and then the, the last section is um, outsiders as scapegoats. And so when I think about outsiders today, um, I would think about probably, um, you know, people who are um, immigrants, people, you know, who are refugees fleeing violence in their countries. And the way that we talk about in American society, we tend to blame them for, oh, they're taking our jobs. Oh, they're drug dealers or whatever. <laughs> um, but that, that yeah. there's really problems going on within our society. And we're putting those, the blame on these outsiders, these people who are just trying to survive. Right. So there's, I think there are a lot of scapegoats today in our, in our country, in our society, in, in the church. Um, but mostly they're the people whose voices don't get heard. They're the, they're the people that um, are overlooked and that others don't, don't stand up for them, you know? Yeah. I, um, I mentioned Democrats earlier because typically that's what you see in the church, right? Like a lot of people in the church blame the Democrats. But the same thing does happen from that other side, right? Like mm-hmm. Democrats also scapegoat Republicans for all the issues. And that's yeah. why you, that's how you get polarization is just both sides mm-hmm. scapegoating the other side. Right. Um, <laughs> you mentioned poor people. Um, I should have explained this before I started laughing. But it made me think of there's there's a scene in the show Glee and it, it's the one of the most satirical, like stupidest moments where uh, one of the coaches, Sue Sylvester, is on there and she makes this statement. She's like, you know how I want to solve ho- the issue of homelessness. When I see homeless people, I just yell at them and say, why not try not being homeless or why not give not being homeless a chance? That's how the yep. line goes. And I'm like, wow. Yep. It's just so dumb that it is funny. But that's that's literally what scapegoating is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because the like the problems are not usually with the people who are homeless. The problems are with the systems and the sins of you know greed and the fact that we're not concerned about our neighbor and loving our neighbor. Right? It's our sins, but they pay the price for the sins. So yeah. Right. yeah. So you've been on plenty of other podcasts. Is there a question that rarely gets asked that you wish you were asked more often? I mean, I, I wish, um, I wish people would ask me more about my, um, my upbringing or my heritage as a Mexican, as a Mexican American, <laughs> Just, hmm. right. but so, I don't look Mexican, especially right now. Cause I have, I have red <laughs> hair, my hair is dyed. Um, but I grew up in, um, a Mexican American family and that's like very key to, you know, who I am as a person. Um, so I don't actually get to talk about that much. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Reverend Dr. Jennifer Bashaw, would you mind telling us how your Mexican American heritage has influenced your life <laughs> today? This is the best cop out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, my family, um, the Mexican side of my family, so my, my mom's side is not Mexican, it's my dad's side that's Mexican. Um, we're very community oriented, communal oriented, very collectivist, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that helped me a lot growing up to, to read the Bible and read the Gospels um, and understand Jesus in a way that I think is closer to the original um, way that the gospel writers or the biblical writers intended it. You know, so I, it's, it's like that's push against the um, individualist society that we have in general in America, like it was an alternative, you know, so we were really good at taking care of one another. And, you know, just the idea of um, what is good for the community is good for the, the individual instead of the other way around. Right. So mm-hmm. I think um, that has helped me a lot in um, my 
cho chosen field, in the, the fact that I love reading the Gospels, in the fact that I'm a teacher, um, uh, in the fact that I'm writing about scapegoats. Because I <laughs> the very first yeah. story in the book is um, – is about the shooting um, at the Walmart, you oh. know, at the border, and how many uh, Mexican Americans were killed in that. And the guy who did the shooting talked about, you know, we need to get rid of this invasion of of um, mm. of Hispanic people. And so, uh, yeah, it hits close to home. When I have I have people who I have people in my family who live all over Texas and all border towns and everything. So, yeah, mm. um, my my Hispanic heritage is uh, important. Right. Spoiling the book, though, I've <laughs> I've been saving up for it. And here we go. Yeah. Right. So where can people go to see all of your books and everything that you do? Hmm. So I'm not one of those people that has like my own website or anything like that. It's so easy. <laughs> you can make your own. Oh, I don't. But um, I bet you if you put my full name in to um, into Google, Jennifer Garcia Bashaw then um, lots of things will come up. Like my book's on Amazon, my book's, you know, Fortress Press printed, uh, published it, so you can find it there. And then you'll probably find other things that I've done, um, like Theology Beer Camp stuff, maybe, Bible for Normal People. I do things for the Bible for Normal People um, from time to time. I'm a nerd in residence, if you know what that is. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> the Bible for normal people. So yeah, so just look me yeah. up um, and, and find me that way. Maybe one day I'll have my own website, but not yet. <laughs> I do love the Bible for normal people. Josh, Josh made our website. I know you can do it. <laughs> I, I didn't even make this website. I literally like on Captivate, it has like where I can just hit a button and say, do you want a free website? And I said, yes. Wow. And that's that's it. That's all that I did. That's pretty easy. Maybe I should <laughs> and, do that. And it just like uploaded our own bio to the bottom which is great because tj's is something like i was born and i now live <laughs> that's it that's, that's what cool. it says that's yep. <laughs> but i'm also on facebook jennifer garcia bishaw and on um instagram yeah and i i don't do much on twitter i'm there but i don't actually do much because people are mean on twitter <laughs> man <laughs> so if you google her full name uh, first thing that comes up, it has like her name and you can hit overview or videos. Videos are like a couple podcasts. Like I see one with trip here. Uh, then you got uh, your okay. Campbell thing, your, your Twitter. And then third one is Amazon profile. Oh, so yeah, brilliant. you can do it. You can do it. Yeah. You can just Google her name. It's pretty easy. There's not yeah. another Jennifer <laughs> Garcia Bashaw out there actually. <laughs> That's cool. super convenient. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, one thing that we like to ask every guest is if you had to recommend one tangible action for our listeners to take to better maintain the uni the unity of the church, what practical action would you recommend for our listeners to to do that they can do right now? Mm. So there are so many actions that I talk about in my book that people <laughs> in the church can do. So I think, first of all, read my book. <laughs> no, but, yes. but one of the things is to ask questions like um, in your church, Ask the people, your pastors, right? What are we doing to make sure that um, the the poor, the infirm, the women, the outsiders in our church are not being scapegoated, mm -hmm. right? Like ask the questions because normally um, people continue to be scapegoated because we don't bring up the issue. We just let it go. So like literally go to your pastors and ask, what are we doing to make sure that the people who are victimized in society are not being victimized here in our church? Mm. Yeah. yeah, man. Yeah. So what, what would we see change in the world if everyone did that? Well, I think we would start looking a little bit more like the kingdom of God, mm. right? That's um, the we would we would have a little bit uh, better idea of what equality is, what loving your neighbor is. Um, so I think I think that's a huge change. It's an important change. Yeah, yeah. for sure. All right. Wow, so, that was good. That's great. Before we wrap up, uh, we like to do our God Moment segment. Not sure if you were familiar with the show. And if you're listening, this is the God Moment segment. We just talk about <laughs> what God's been up to with us for the past week, whenever, really. There's no time limit. It used to just be in the past week, but people are busy, you know. <laughs> Sometimes we do a lot of these episodes. But what well, God's been up with us recently, and I always make Joshua go first. It can be a blessing. It can be a challenge. It can be a moment of worship. But Josh, do you have a God Moment for us? Yeah, and... uh Actually, I got I got a few that I'm going to consolidate into one big, sombering, grieving challenge. Yeah. Um, over the weekend, 
I, I found out one of the the youth that I used to help youth minister uh, passed away. Um, mm. And really tough. His his brother his brother was my age, and he passed away a few years ago. So really hard on that family. Um, the funeral actually tonight. So that's rough. And then today my company decided to do a big layoff and one of my good friends got fired as well as one of my managers. So it's been a, been a hard day and, uh, you know, just learning to rely on God more and just challenge to find comfort and, um, peace, you know, did the other Josh get fired? No, no. The other Josh is fine. Yeah. There's two Joshes at my work, both born in the same state with the same birthday. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. As long as they're okay. Yeah. But I'll go next. Uh, to give our esteemed guest and guest host as much time as they need. Uh, but uh, my God moment for, you know, my God moment. I'm going to stop. I'm going to try really hard to stop putting time limits on these things. <laughs> but uh, things are getting a little hectic at work. True. But I've got a really strong community around me that is trying to help me get what I need to get done, done, in spite of how rough it is. So mm. I'm extremely grateful for that. And it's been such a blessing. Yeah. I got to say, an unfortunate amount of my t- prayer time these days, I've been praying about your work situations. Well, that's crazy. Yeah. So I wish it would get better. Me too. So, David, do you have a God moment for us? Uh, man, I just have too many to count, man. It's just. <laughs> yeah. That's a very uh, David answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just thinking like, uh, that's a very, I don't know what to say answer. Uh <laughs> But in reality, in reality, man, the last uh, uh, the last like six months have been like a crazy God challenge. And uh, having left the church that I went to for the last decade and uh, my wife and I trying to find somewhere to get plugged in that is not just going to accept us and our service, but that is going to be healthy for us to be a part of. You know, a, a church mm-hmm. that prioritizes church health over church growth. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? And uh, we're still looking, but we believe we've found somewhere that will that will serve as a good home base mm-hmm. as we continue our search. And we've gotten pretty plugged in there. They, their pastor, has recently asked me if I wanted to, uh, you know, just be there as like a consultant for some of the young people if they want to talk to somebody or pray with somebody or whatever, uh, which is, it's nice. I like it. And so that's Mm -hmm. been a God moment. And then this morning I went and got a haircut and my barber was sharing some of the things that, that God was doing in his life. And so that was, that was a God moment. I got to hear somebody else's testimony about how Mm -hmm. they're now getting to, partially own the barbershop that they've been working in for the last few years. So that's oh, really cool. Awesome. Pretty sweet. Praise God. So Jennifer, do you have a God moment for us this week? Yeah, I think I just, I had one today in class and I love when I have God moments that my students sort of facilitate to me, you know, mm-hmm. God shows up in the things that they say so often. Um, we're talking about, um, the false self and the true self. And we're kind of looking at um, how we've developed as, as people. And one of the students, we were talking through the whole time and one student raised his hand at the end and said, you know, I found that the more time I spend um, alone with God, the more I come to understand what is my false self and my true self. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yes, man, like that yeah. just spoke to me. And it was, you know, a student, it's not, he's, I'm the teacher here, but he's the one who um, was speaking truth into the moment it was great yeah Yeah, that's always great we love to hear it so thank you so much for your time today dr bashaw thank you so much for listening we love you uh please consider sharing the episode with a friend or an enemy you can share with your cousin yeah preferably cousins cousins work Uh, we love our cousins uh david's cousins david's cousins Uh, he's got yeah my my 300 cousins yeah uh, make sure you get your ticket for our convention. Eric Nevins will be there, head of the Christian Podcasting Association. We're going to be giving out free stuff. Everybody loves free stuff. We're going to have Q&A sessions with church leaders. Check out our Patreon. We have cool bonus segments on there like our Pet Peeves, which is a fun one. You should check it out. Yeah. Also, while you're checking stuff out, if you want to hear TJ, myself, and occasionally David 
geek out about random things and look at the stuff that we're geeking out on from a Christian perspective, go over to systematicgeekology.org. There's a host tab, has both me and TJ's name on there. It doesn't have David's name yet, but if you hit the guest tab, you'll find the, te- the episodes he's on as well. So find them, check them out. It's fun. Yeah, we just recorded an awesome episode about what if we discovered alien life. So check that out. It's yeah, I'm excited to edit awesome. that as the producer. <laughs> yeah. I always get to hear things first. It's great. Not before me. I'm there. Uh, well, we hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, come back next week. Uh, we'll be speaking with Andrew Gilsmith, the author of Our Lady of the Artilex, a Catholic sci-fi novel. After that, we'll be back with another roundtable discussion, this time about the particularities and differences in one another. We need to learn to embrace in unity. You worded that really strangely, Josh. We will be interviewing former career criminal, minister, and author Stephen Snook. And finally, at the end of season one, Francis Chan will be joining us. Yeah. Uh, primarily because David's going to keep messaging him until he does. Yeah. I mean, I keep him. spamming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm spamming <laughs> their website where it says uh, request a speaking engagement. Uh, and as long as it's free to keep spamming it, I'm going to keep spamming it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, I, it's uh, cool to not have something behind a paywall, but they really should have <laughs> made it like a yeah. dollar or something. Yeah, and, and Francis, we know you listen. So just know that uh, the Dr. Reverend, the great Dr. Reverend, also wants you on. So you might as well just... Might as well just do it, man. Yeah, that would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Whole Church Podcast. Remember, you can always sponsor our show at patreon.com forward slash the whole church podcast. And you'll get extra bonus episodes like this week's Whole Church News segment, where we go over news and events and pray requests from around the world in the church today.